you will. Dear God, we come to you now, and we just ask that you just speak directly to our hearts, our minds, our souls, dear Lord, and just let us come away with the message that you have prepared this morning, and then allow us to receive it in the proper way. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. I want to continue on um, this sermon series that we've been going through about turning the page, and um, this isn't just... uh, isolated to a new chapter in your life or something, you know, this isn't promoting you to go out and just change everything, turn the page and all that. So this is, this is talking about some individual pages that we need to turn. We talked about, you know, people being too comfortable and we've talked about different things. So this morning, um, I want to, I want to talk to you about something that, um, it affects everything that we do. Um, it, it, whether you realize it or not, it affects every kind of relationship you have. Um, it affects your relationship with Jesus Christ, with your spouse. Um, it, it pretty much is an all-encompassing kind of um, kind of I, the kind of thing that we deal with on a very personal and um, with with our personalities. So. Um, this morning, I'm going to be talking to you about image, okay? And uh, I'm going to be talking to you about self-image and what, how we view ourselves and what is the proper way to view, to view ourselves. But before I get started, there is a foundation that has to be laid and there's an understanding that we all have to come away with, and it is the proper starting, starting spot. And that is that we have to have the genuine, true image of who God is. And I think sometimes things get off kilter, and we never get on the rails on a solid footing, um, never really get on the trail We just never really get a proper, genuine start because we don't really have a genuine understanding of who God is. And what ends up happening is that after you get involved in church and you get saved, then you start to develop these ideas. And here's what we always teach here is that if your idea or your philosophy is not rooted in the Bible, I worked on how how to say that word. Did I say it right? Rooted? Okay, because I wanted to say rooted, (laughs) which is the proper way to say it. Okay, so I get it, Johanna? Okay, good. It has to be rooted in the Bible. All right, so... um, I think sometimes we have an image of a God that is beneficial to us. Now listen, God is our benefactor. All good things come from God. But let's be very, very clear. What Jesus Christ says is, and and these are actual words with a mandate in them, it's that you come to me and die daily. So in order for us, in order for us to have a proper self-image in the things that we think about ourselves and the way that we handle the internal voices, somebody else got those? Yeah, okay. Ariane asked why I turned the TV on. Um, last, our, what's that fire thing that goes in your TV? Fire stick. Fire stick. Ours went out in my bedroom, our bedroom, last night, the night before, and it's like, it's just silent in there, like we're psychopaths or something, trying to sleep in silence. <laughs> I, was like, I asked Karen, like, are we psychopaths or what's going on here? We've got to get some noise going, you know, and, and she says, why can't you just enjoy the silence? I was like, nothing good comes from, I start hearing the voices, I start talking back to them, you know, next thing I know, it's six in the morning, I haven't slept, you know, I got to get some background noise just to distract the guys in my head, all right? So I don't know if you're there with me. You can keep lying to yourself if you're not, all right? But um, what, we, uh, 
What we really encourage here is that everything that you build your life on has to be in the Bible. And we talk about how great friends are, and they mean well, and they'll, they're free with their advice, and they're confident in their advice. Even, even those friends who that advice has failed them for years, they will freely give you, this is what now, this is what I do, okay? And it's like, all right. But anyways, if you can't find what they're telling you, and it's not based on biblical truths, then it's not correct, and you shouldn't use it. And so before, before you can truly understand who you are, you have to know who God is and who Jesus Christ, when he comes in the form of man, and what he did. And after the, after, on Easter morning, you have people that don't recognize Jesus Christ. And the reason is that he was not the savior that they were expecting. Okay, they wanted someone who was going to run out the Romans. Okay, he was the offering. He laid down his life. He did everything that they didn't think he was going to do, all right? And when they saw him for who he truly is, then it changed their life forever. And they went from people who were scared to death to people that died willingly as martyrs, okay? So that's my preamble real quick. And then this is the text I'm going to use this morning. It's out of Genesis. And this is pretty profound. Um, it would, I don't have the intelligence to, to bring all what's in here, um, nor the, the time. We, would, we could preach this for three or four years solid and still just be at the surface of what's going on here. But this is the creation story. Okay? This is a man being created. And it says, then God said, and you'll see the, you'll see the pronouns used here that these are um, plural, so we know that Jesus Christ is there and the Holy Spirit is there. So the, the God, the three, the Godhead is there. It says, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. And then he gives them dominion. He gives them, you know, he places them above animals and above everything else on this. It says, let them have dominion over the fish, the birds, over the cattle, over all the creeping things that creep. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So um, this was, man is created. He's not evolved. He is created out of dust. And it says that the way that he creates everything else is he speaks it into existence, but he does a, a different kind of process with man. And what he does with man, it says that the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. And then he does something that he doesn't do with any other creation that he has. And it says that he breathes the breath of life into the nostrils of the man. So, with that being said, the, the premise here that, that the Bible is laying out is that each and every one of us are created in the image of God. And the Bible is clear that even though we have fallen and even though we are cursed by sin, that has not removed the image of God. And we are created to be walking, living, breathing examples of Jesus Christ. So we are created to be in the likeness of Jesus Christ, and sin has divided that, it has scarred that up a little bit, it has made it blurry, but when we come to know Jesus Christ, we have to take on the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now that is where you have to know who Jesus Christ truly is and what he expects from you. And what he expects from you is for you to come down and to give up your will and your plans for your life and say, give me your plans for my life. Pick up the cross that he has for you and then carry that on through. 
And that requires some things that are kind of tough. And those things are, and this is when we see the likeness of God, is that we are going to have to be people of love. All right? We are, anything that doesn't come from love doesn't come from God. That's in, you know, the letters of John, 1 John. In fact, it says that God is love. And everything that God does is love. And if it's not love, then it's not from God. So what we have to do is become people of love. And we have to become people of forgiveness. And we have to become people who are capable of showing mercy and grace. And that is the peop- that's towards people who fail, towards people who fall down. Because here is the reality of the situation when it comes to ministry. No one cares anything that we have to say until they know that we love and care for them. There has to be a form of trust. And we can't get trust by screaming at them or yelling at them how terrible and how doomed to hell they are. So we have to take on the likeness Of God. And here's the other thing. Each and every one of us was created in the image of God. So we have, we are carrying, each and every person on this earth is carrying the image of God. And in a throwaway society, it becomes way too easy to discard people like garbage. And in fact, the in if you read Revelation. It tells you that in the last days, everything is disposable. Everything gets thrown away, even the souls of man. And it's talking about how we can discard the value of human life in this world at the blink of an eye. And that starts with the beginning when we perform abortions. And then it goes all the way through life when we let people live homeless, we let people starve to death. I get it, okay? People are taking advantage of the system. It's happening right now. I I read the same newspapers and, and stuff that you, I understand all that, okay? But there are genuine people in need in this country that can't get the help that they need. And they can't get the step up that they need. And Society has deemed them and devalued their life that that's okay. All right. And then we move on through to where, you know, depends on where people end up. You know, the older people, they're hard to, aging parents are hard to take care of. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But there's value in their lives. And, and then even at the end, I mean, Yes, some people have done some horrible things, but there has, to be, there has to be a value placed on life. And that is because every life was created in the image of God. Now, that doesn't mean that we agree with what they do. We encourage it, you know, and, but it does mean that we are forced to love them, truly love them, and truly pray for them. Don't raise your hand, but when we talk about praying for sinners or praying for those who we disagree with, how many of us actually say those prayers in a very genuine way? Ask yourself these hard questions, because here's the deal, and I have been guilty of this, of giving sermons and, um, you know, just asking some questions and get you to think just a little bit. And you go away, and by Tuesday, it's washed over you, and you're back into the swing of things. So I have prayed over this whole COVID thing is to allow me to present God's Word in a way that pricks our hearts and our souls. And I want you, and and I've probably been doing this ever since I started preaching, when you leave here, I want my sermons to bother you. Okay, because if they're not bothering you, you know, and there's times for fellowship and to celebrate and to celebrate victories and to get all that together, 
but at the same time, we should walk away from here and we should be motivated to make the changes that the Bible's requiring us to make. And I think that this world is showing the evidence where we aren't being bothered anymore. Okay? So I get that there are horrible people that deserve what they got, and I get that people are taking advantage of the situation and steaming the systems and all that stuff. I get all that. But at the end of the day, we as Christians have to look at people and we have to, sh we have, to have eyes that show value to every human life on earth. Because here is the real deal. Jesus Christ died for them just as much as he died for us in this room today. Okay? He died for them. So, here's the, here is the truth of the matter. Perception is reality. Now, your perception might be different than my perception. And sometimes when you look at this public polling and, and what's going on in different situations, and I'm not just... I'm not talking about politics or anything. You talk about all the, how people saw something, and it's like, what world are they living in? What, I mean, what are and it's, they have a different perception of things. And you have to understand that my perception is different than people who were born in New York City, and they've, I've got different experiences than them. And we come to it with different, you know, different mistakes being made, and we are jaded in different kind of ways, and we're cynical in different kind of ways. And we look at things, the very same thing, and we can walk away with different realities. My favorite story is there's a man, and it has been raining, and the area's flooded, and he's trying to get to check on his cattle, but the, what is usually a creek has turned into a raging river. And so he's trying to find a way over. And there's a man on the other side of this now raging river. And he asked him, hey, how do I get to the other side of this river? And the guy says, you already are on the other side of the river. Do you get it? It's his perception. They're warring percep perceptions. But the, re the reality is that their, your perception is the reality. It doesn't matter what I've, if, if, if you think something of me in your life, that is the reality of me. So the Bible speaks about this. It's out of 1 Corinthians. It says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Okay, so here's what is being taught. And what is being taught here is that we have the ability to look at ourselves. And, you know, the, the, in, in Corinth, they made mirrors. They're kind of famous for mirrors. They sold mirrors. And mirrors back in this day, was, they were just shined up metal. So you didn't get just like a clear vision of who you are. But you kind of got a, an idea. But, um, you know, it wasn't crystal clear like the mirrors that we have now. All right. So what is being taught here is that sometimes we can look into the mirror and we can see a person, you know, that does not exist. And we can lie to ourselves. Has anybody ever lied to themselves about anything? All right. And the reason why we do that is because we want to justify the things that we have done and we want to turn the story around to where we are actually the victim, whether or not we were the perpetrator or whatever in the situation. And then we want to come out and be able to say, I'm all right, I did okay. And what the Bible is saying is that you can do that. And you can look in a mirror and you can see dimly of who you are and you can convince yourself of these things. But at some point, at some point, you're gonna come face to face with Jesus Christ and you're going to have to be confronted with who you truly are and my suggestion to you is to do that now and to take care of it now so that you can live this life the true you who Jesus Christ created you to be and not have to wait to have that face to face with Jesus Christ and so 
let's, let's get into a little bit about how we view ourselves and, and how we think of ourselves. So what's the difference between, because we use these terms a lot, self-confidence and self-esteem. And something that, something that plagues us is that these two actually get merged together. And your self-confidence you know, is what makes you have your self-esteem and what affects your self-esteem. And your self-esteem you know, is tied into your self-confidence. And so sometimes when we fail, it affects our understanding of who we are in a negative way. And it can be detrimental to our lives. So self-confidence, this is the measure of how much we trust and how much we believe in our own abilities. So, um, you know, if, if you're uh, whatever, you know, if you're going to, you ever seen someone hammer a nail for the first time? They just kind of tap, 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 you know, that kind of tap, making sure they're not going to hit their finger or anything. All right. And then the Bradley boys did it with like two hits. Right? Because you've done it nine million times. And they got a, a confidence about it. Um, I saw a, an interview with Michael Jordan, and he talked about, you know, did you ever think, you know, that the shot wasn't going to go in? And he seriously, genuinely said, every shot I took, I thought was going to go in. And that's a lot of self-confidence, okay? Self-esteem is a whole different kind of thing. And self-esteem is the measure in your overall understanding or your overall value of who you think, how much you think your worth is. So your self-worth is equivalent to your self-esteem. It's you, how much value you place on you. What are you worth? And esteem comes from a Latin word that means to appraise, value, rate, or estimate. And thus it is our own appraisal of our self-worth. So sometimes when we fail, not only does it kill our self-confidence, but it can also kill your self-esteem. And then sometimes there are those who their self-confidence and in in some failures that they have in life negatively impact their self-esteem to the point to where they start making terrible, horrible decisions in life. And when we talk about turning the page on image, what we really need to understand is that when we start with the premise that every life is valuable, then we can start with healthy self-esteem. Because if you, if you talk to someone who's going through rough times, their self-esteem is suffering. And here is, the, here is how this can play down from the general population all the way down to an individual, is that, let's just say it like it is, we live in a world that can devalue human life in an instance. We can, you know, you don't even care, story's over, go on about my life, okay? We devalue people for, you know, we, we say, well, they deserved it, they, whatever. So we get to where we are capable of devaluing human life, and we accept that, all right? And then we get to where people mess up, and people have made bad decisions, and people get a label put on them, and then for the rest of their life, they are fighting that label, and they never get the opportunity to improve or to change their self-esteem or the perception that we have of them. So our negative perception of them, our inability, let me just say it like it is, our inability to live the image of God that we were created in, our inability to do that can negatively impact someone's self-esteem. And then you have people who now are walking around and they don't feel like they have any value of, on their life, that their life is not really worth anything. And we as Christians, if we play any part 
into killing someone's self-esteem, then that is the total opposite of what the Bible teaches. And I'm not talking about puffing up people and, and giving them, you know, this isn't a everybody gets a trophy kind of sermon, all right? But what this is is that we have to start legitimately getting to a place to where everything we do here truly glorifies Jesus Christ. And what that means is that there isn't anyone that we don't place the highest value on. And when we have these kids come in, every kid, every kid there should feel like they are they have the same value as any other kid there. And everybody that walks through this church they should know that we love them and we care for them and we want their soul to go to heaven and we want them to be healthy. We want them to be spiritually healthy. We want their families to become strong and stay together. And we want to accept them, you know, with their faults. We're not, you know, we're not saying that all living is right and we're not okay with it, right? But we have to make sure that when we work with people, they understand that we value their lives. And what is happening in this world today is that too many people don't come to church because they don't think we care about them. I'm just telling you like it is. I've had conversations with people in the last three or four weeks. I told you I was at a funeral and a guy said, when I was nine years old, I got a label put on me and I still got it on me. I'm 44 years old, okay? And if church people, if Christians play a part into that, then that's wrong. And that's not understanding truly who Jesus Christ is. The Bible says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? So we have to, we have to view people as temples, that they are if, they, if they're not saved, they are potential temples of the Holy Spirit. Now, do you understand what that means? That means that the more temples that we build here, the more of a Holy Spirit connection that we have in our community. And if you think that we can change this world, I'm telling you that if you build more and more temples, if you pass the word on, if people are saved and changed and they're filled with the Holy Spirit, then that is how you change communities. And we, and, and I'm, I'm just telling you, you can buy all the lobbyists you want and change all the laws, but, you know, people still buy drugs, still people traffic it. You know, I've been known to speed every once in a while. I know it's against the law, break it every day, all that stuff, okay? So you can, you can make all the laws you want, but what Jesus Christ said is, I'm not making laws on tablets. We're now changing the hearts of men. And if you really want change in this world, and I'm all for changing the laws, okay? I'm all for it. Don't get me wrong. But if you really want to change people, you change their hearts. And you have to start with the ability to let them know that we love and care for them and that we are legitimately trying to bring goodness into their lives. And so it says that you are, about, you are not your own. And this is, a, this is an understanding, too, for each and every one of us, is that we are not our own. If we are Christians, our lives don't belong to us. We have been bought. And if you can't say that, and if you can't buy into that, then I'm here to tell you that on Judgment Day, there may be an issue. Because when you stand before the throne of judgment... God's going to ask, why should I let you into heaven? And your friends are not going to be there. Your family's not going to be there. Not even your grandma's going to be allowed to be there. And you're not going to have a defense because the cards are stacked against us. There's no way for us to push ourselves into heaven. It can't happen. The only way you get there is if Jesus Christ stands up and says, this one has been bought by my blood, he belongs to me, let him or her into heaven. And that's the only way you get there. But if you truly believe that, and you truly believe that that's your ticket into heaven, then you got to start living it now. It just can't be the card you play at the end of days when you're in front and say, yeah, I got bought by the blood of Christ. Did you really? Did you really? 
Jesus speaks to that, right? Am I wrong? Lord, when did we give you water? When did we feed you? When did we visit you in heaven? And then there were those that said, Lord, did we not give you water? Did we not visit you in heaven? And what's he say? Depart from me, for I never knew you. So, listen, this isn't, and Mike said it in the prayer, this is not an observational religion. This is a give up your life and accept what God has for you kind of life. And it's tough. That's why it's called the Christian walk. Okay, It's a day-to-day, step-by-step, pick up your cross and move forward with what God has planned for you. And where we get rubbed is, sometimes we come to God and say, I need you to be the God for me. And God's saying, that's not what I do. I need you to come and be the Aaron that I need you to be. And sometimes when I live, my living is, I devalue life, I throw people away, I can discard people, I can be done with them, push them away, and that is not at all what Jesus teaches. All right? And a proper self-identity is knowing that we are raised with Christ, and for those who, who seek things above, we don't seek the things of this earth. We seek the things in, of heavenly reward. And to do that, to live this life, you have to have the mind of Christ. You have to change your mindset. You have to allow Jesus Christ to change your mindset. And when Christ appears in his glory, then we will also appear in his glory. So in order to perform this and to do this, this is a deal where you have to give up yourself. You have to say, empty me of me, fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can be the perfect vessel to go out and live. And it says, love has been perfected among us in this way that we may have boldness in the days of our judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect. We love him because he first loved us. And so the understanding here is that every life has value. Even when we were at our worst, he still loved us. And, he, and because of that love, we are obligated to love him and to love each other. And then this is where you get your self-confidence. It's not a prideful self-confidence. A prideful self-confidence will let you down. And I'm telling you, I have watched some of the most confident people on this earth crash and burn because their abilities, I mean, I, I'm, I'm living proof of it, right? You know, my physical abilities are leaving me, okay? And I don't see it all the time, but every once in a while I see something and it's like, hmm, you know, that's too bad. But that is life, and that is the way that it happens. So if you're living a life where everything is based on your ability to do things, you're going to crash and burn. And I'm here to tell you that your confidence can be in Jesus Christ because he will never leave you, he will never forsake you, he can never be, you, he can never be separated from his love. We are his. He paid for us with his blood. So here's the understanding, and here's what we're turning the page on. What we are turning the page on is that we have to be people that live the image that we were created in, and that is the image of God. And that is the ability to love people. That is the ability to forgive people. And when we come into contact with people, they have to understand that we care for them and that we love them and we want, we want what's best for them. And we have to stop throwing people away. We have to stop discarding people. We have to stop labeling people. We have to present the true Jesus Christ. But my personal challenge to you is that 
we have to understand, if we're going to present the genuine Jesus Christ, we have to know who that is. And I think some of us have a perfect image of who that is, and then some of us have evolved our, our thoughts over the time, and we all, all are selfish, and we all can come away with wanting a God that works for us, and that fits all the checkbox for me, and that I can walk away and say, yeah, that's, that, now that God I can follow. Well, God says, come to me and die daily, and pick up the cross I put before you. So I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. And this is a, this is a, this is a subject that, um, that is r- really, really hitting me on a, on a personal level. And um, we, live in a, we live in a community that um, not everybody gets a fair shot in when people make mistakes, they get into a, a system to where they can't get out. And that mistake leads them to make another mistake, and then that leads them to another mistake. And then we as Christians and we as, you know, the upright citizens or whatever, whatever you want to call yourself, we discard those people. And we kick them out. And, and I'm here to tell you that that is not at all who Jesus Christ was. Jesus Christ went to dinner with those people. Jesus Christ got to know those people. And those people knew that Jesus Christ loved them. And that's why they flocked to him. That's why the Pharisees couldn't run them out. That's why the authorities could not push the crowds away from him. Because he presented the genuine Jesus Christ. And if we present the genuine Jesus Christ people will flock to us too because they will feel love they will feel value for the first time maybe in their lives or in a long time so I'm going to ask you this morning to pray that you can be that we can become that type of church we're a great church, we're a friendly church we're a loving church and we do a lot here don't misread me all right. but there's so much more we can do there's so many people out there that need help if you got something looking at you in, in the face this week and you need prayer, come up. If you conquered something this week, come up. Let's give God the victory. If you just want to come up and, and lay it down and lay your burdens down and come up and do it, if you've never met Jesus Christ as your Savior, come up and make the best decision you ever made. Oh, thank, you all. thank you for tuning in to Star Church's sermon. We truly hope that the sermon edified you today and brought you closer to the Lord. For more information about Star Church, visit our website at stargbchurch.com. Once again, that's stargbchurch.com. If you would like to visit our church, our address is 4925 State Road, 142 North, El Dorado, Illinois, 62930. We now pray that God will bless you as you enter the mission field and bring his word to the world. And as always, we will see you next time here at Star Church.